right, if you have your Bible, please turn to Job chapter 37. Now let's begin at verse 5. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth. Likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man. I think that means stops them from their labors for a time. That all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also, with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when he quiets the earth by the south wind? With him have you spread out the sky, strong as a cast metal mirror? Teach us what we should say to him, for we can prepare nothing because of the darkness. Should he be told that I wish to speak? If a man were to speak, surely he would be swallowed up. Even now, men cannot look at the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind is past and cleared them. He comes from the north as golden splendor, with God his awesome majesty. As for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is excellent in power, in judgment, and abundant justice. He does not oppress. Therefore, men fear him. He shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. May God's blessing rest upon his inspired word. Let's pray. Father, please help us as we once again tread upon holy ground and attempt to delve just a bit into your mysteries, into your nature. Guide us by your spirit. Uh, remove from us those things that would hinder the working of your word in our hearts. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. It is, of course, of great importance for us to have clear views of the nature of God. I mentioned before that I had the opportunity, I think it was in 1998, to attend a debate that was conducted at the University of Tennessee between a Christian and an atheist. The Christian was Dr. William Lane Craig, presently research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. And the, the uh, atheist, who he preferred to be called the non-theist, was Dr. Massimo Piglucci, who's now at the City University of New York. The debate question was simply, does God exist? And there were Christians who were manning a table you know, distributing tracts, uh, literature, selling books, and non-Christians who were doing the same at another table. Among the tracts, or the non-tracts, as the non-Christians called them, <laughs> were, was one on Bible contradictions. And, uh, and I took a copy of it, looked at it, it had all these ver various alleged contradictions in the Bible, like Exodus 20 says, thou shalt not kill, and then Exodus 21 says to execute somebody who, who kills. And they said, well, that's a contradiction, and things like that that you and I could probably uh, easily explain. But some of these alleged contradictions or discrepancies dealt with the nature of God. They asked the question, does God change his mind? And then they quoted scriptures that seem to indicate that he does. Uh, can he be seen? And they quoted scriptures that seem to indicate he cannot, and scriptures that seem to indicate that he can. Does he have a bodily form or not, etc.? Uh, several weeks ago now, I think it was in July, Pastor Nick and I met with a representative of an apologetical ministry called Ratio Christi, or Reason of Christ, or Reason for Christ. One of their goals is to equip high school and college students to defend their faith in the face of critical attacks on campus. Their ministry has uh, compiled some surprising statistics. For example, the proportion of faculty in American universities who self-identified as atheists 
is over, over five times the proportion of people who self-identified as atheists in the general population. Evangelicals are the only religious group about which a majority of faculty have negative feelings, according to the surveys. Tufts University professor Daniel Dennett said of his students, quote, they will see me as just another liberal professor trying to cajole them out of some of their convictions. And they are dead right about that. That's what I am, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. The late philosophy professor Richard Rorty, who served on the faculty at Princeton, Stanford, and the University of Virginia, said, quote, we try to arrange things so that students who enter college as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. The goal of education is to help these youth escape the grip of their frightening, vicious, dangerous parents. Some of those are present with us today. <laughs> so we're going to go right on trying to discredit you in the eyes of your children trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. How much are you paying towards that education, mom and dad? How much have you saved up, squirreled away to send your kids to sit under this kind of teaching? So one reason it's important that we have clear views of God is so that when we're confronted with assaults, on our faith on a college campus or in a news magazine or on the web, we would not stumble, but on the contrary, we would be able to help others and give a reasonable defense of what we believe. So last week we embarked upon what can be described as the greatest possible endeavor, the study of God. The study of God, it's been said, is to ascend by a chain of reasoning from things visible to things invisible from palpable to impalpable, from terrestrial to celestial, from the creature even up to the creator. We noted that the study of God has eternal benefit, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus prayed, John 17. And we noted that there's great benef benefit to us in this life, uh, as our study of God increases our trust, and our peace, and our joy, right here, and our comfort in this life. Although it's good for us to strive to understand God better, we saw that it's important for us to remember there will always be things about Him that are beyond our capacity to understand. Behold, God is great, and we know Him not, neither can the number of His years be searched out. Job 36, 26. Author Bertrand Brasnay wrote, the characteristic attitude of the religious man in the presence of deity is an attitude of worship. And it is psychologically impossible to worship that which is completely understood. As the French so neatly put it, a God defined is a finite God. Religion must insist we do not know the whole of God. It must at the same time insist that what we do know of God is true. There are two sources, as we said last week, of our knowledge of God, general revelation, what he has revealed about himself to uh, all people, uh, the created through the created world that he has made, and special revelation, what he reveals about himself through his supernaturally inspired word. We learn much more about him, of course, through his word uh, than we can learn through his world. From the study of the world, we learn about nature. From the study of the word, we learn about God's nature. We saw that the scriptures reveal God to be self-existent and eternal. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, Isaiah 44, 6. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, Psalm 90, verse 2. He is the great first cause of the universe. Had there ever been a time when the first cause did not exist, nothing could exist. God is the independent, self-existent creator of all things. As you know not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so you know not the works of God who makes all. Ecclesiastes 11.5. Uh, w. A. Prattney in his book, The Nature and Character of God, asks the question, who made God? And he answers, no one. He had no origin, no beginning. There never was a time when he did not exist. This is impossible to illustrate because he is unlike anything and anyone else in the universe. He made it all. He made us all. 
Then he raises the question, where did God come from? The answer is he fills all the universe and everything beyond it. So he didn't come from anywhere. He was always here before the worlds were made. So there's no place where he never was in existence. Now, an atheist or a non-theist might argue, as Dr. Piglucci did in that debate that I attended, that it's no more reasonable to assume that God has always existed than it is to assume that the natural world has always existed. To quote him, if you say God was always there, it's the same as saying matter and energy were always there. But Dr. Craig countered that the evidence we now have clearly indicates that the universe had a beginning. And virtually all scientists agree on that point. Dr. Stephen Hawking said, quote, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. And so Dr. Craig's argument was, premise one, whatever begins has a cause. The premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, the universe has a cause. He said, now from the very nature of the case, as the cause of space and time, this uh, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, immaterial being of unimaginable power who created the universe. Moreover, he said, I would argue it must be personal, for how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without the effect. You follow his reasoning. If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without the effect, which is the universe itself. The only way for the cause to be timeless, and yet for the effect to begin in time, is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. Thus we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to a personal creator. Not, not just a force, because uh, as he said, the, the, then the universe would always have existed as of necessity from the force. God is the self-existent creator of all that is. Secondly, we saw last time, God is not bound by time because God precedes time. God supersedes it. He's not bound by it. He sees the end for the beginning, therefore. The Bible says one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Second uh, Peter 3. C.S. Lewis said, God is not hurried along in the time stream of this universe. Succession, he said, belongs to a finite being, but God is not a finite being. He cannot be omniscient and yet obtain knowledge from experience. Succession cannot, therefore, be predicated of him. One theologian writes, he can have no new thoughts as there is no possible source from which to derive them. He can have no new affections or emotions, as he can have no new ideas or knowledge. Therefore, his present consciousness is his eternal consciousness, and eternity to him is what present time is to us. So God is not bound by time, neither is he bound by a physical body. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, the Lord Jesus said, John 4. One theologian put it like this, by the spirituality of God, we understand that his existence or substance is immaterial, a substance or existence possessing properties essentially different from those of matter. Think about this, if God were material, no other material could exist as he is omnipresent, <laughs> everywhere present. He would, of course, if he were material, exclude all other material existences. But the fact that God is a spirit does raise some questions that we didn't address last Sunday. For example, the Bible declares that, quote, God thunders with his majestic voice. We read it in our scripture reading this morning, Job 37. It uses human terms to refer to God. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men, Psalm 11, verse 4. God is described, as you know, as seated upon a throne. He's described in the Bible as tasting, hearing, smelling, going, coming. Mention is made of his eyes, his ears, his eyelids, his nose, his mouth, his lips, his hands, his heart. Dutch theologian Herman Bavink put it this way, to see God face to face is for us impossible, at least here on earth. If, nevertheless, God wills that we should know him, he must descend to the level of the creature. He must accommodate himself to our limited, finite human consciousness. 
He must speak to us in human language. If you were to visit a remote tribe and uh, you brought with you a cell phone, a radio, various things, uh, and, and you had to try to explain to a member of this remote tribe who had never seen such a thing uh, what, let's say, your uh, radio was, uh, how would you do that? Uh, you would uh, probably describe it as a, as a uh, like a cell phone's a little box that catches voices out of the air. And a, and a radio is, is like a drum that catches music out of the sky. You'd have to use terms such as that to give the, the, the person who'd never seen such a thing some idea of what it is. It's like a drum. Uh, what that you have there? Well, it's like a drum that catches music out of the sky. Now, if, if I, as a high school student sitting at our family table in Central Florida, uh, said in my father's presence that a radio is like a drum that catches music out of the sky, my dad would hit the sky. He would hit the ceiling anyway. No, no, Rusty, that is not what a radio does at all. The radio receives electrical signals through electromagnetic waves broadcast at a specific frequency from a transmitter. The receiver converts those signals by a complicated process into intelligible sounds that the human ear can detect. And that he would, then he would commence to, uh, to explain the complicated process in excruciating detail. <laughs> and then he would culminate the lecture with these words, what are they teaching you in school? <laughs> Haven't you studied Marconi, the father of radio? He had a whole lecture on Marconi. And my brother Doug would chime in something like, uh, he may not know anything about Marconi, but he's obviously eaten his share of macaroni. That's the way we would interact with my dad. Now, if my father had tried to explain a radio to a remote tribe that way, it would have been to their ears simply gibberish, or to use a radio term, static. Uh, and they would still not have the slightest inkling of what a radio is. So to give them the slightest inkling, the communicator would have to say something like, it's, it's like a drum that catches music out of the sky. Well, listen, it is easier for a member of a remote tribe to get his mind around a radio than it is for a member of the human race to get his mind around an invisible God. As material beings who move with our feet, see with our eyes, think with our brains, the idea of a purely spiritual being would be completely incomprehensible to us. The words would be gibberish unless he communicated with us in language that we can understand, unless he accommodated himself to our ignorance, or as the Jews put it, tread, treaded the path of the children of man. God treads the path of the children of man to sort of communicate himself to us. Again, theologian Baving said, incomprehensible are the works and actions of God. Neither would we be able to understand anything concerning them if Holy Writ, in speaking about God, had not used such terms as are nearest to our human realm. Therefore, it pleases the Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, because of our feeble comprehension, to stammer after a fashion, and by means of images and words, to deal with us in a manner more pleasing and humble than is due to so great a majesty. Theologians refer to these accommodations as anthropomorphisms, from anthropos and morphism. Anthropos, of course, the Greek word which means man, anthropology, study of man, is familiar to us, and morphe means form. Think of metamorphosis, uh, changing of form. So an anthropomorphism is an ascription uh, to God of human form, or in a wider sense, of human attributes, human emotions. For example, when we read, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Genesis 6.6. 6. John Calvin put it this way, Because our weakness cannot reach his height, any description which we receive of him must be lowered to our capacity in order to be intelligible. And the mode of lowering is to represent him not as he really is, but as we conceive of him, or... I think what he meant was, as we can conceive of him. So when we read that God repented or was sorry that he had made man or he regretted having raised Saul to be king, 1 Samuel 15, 11, we must understand simply that God's procedure has, from our vantage point, changed. Because the same book tells us the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent, 1 Samuel 15, 29. So when the scripture uses such terms... The scripture is describing something real, just as we are when we talk about, about a radio catching music 
from the air, but it is an accommodation to our feeble understanding for a spiritual being to speak to us in such terms. In other words, the self-existent eternal creator is not bound by time, he's not bound by space, and he would be utterly unknowable to us without some accommodation to our limited understanding. Now, you see that all around you. Uh, uh, Dr. Becky, if you went to Dr. Becky, where's Becky? There she is, back there somewhere. Or did she go, does he slip out on a call? If you were to, to ask Dr. Becky, you go to Dr. Becky and say, Dr. Becky, I've got this pain here and I get this, and she were to do some tests and determine what you, what you have. She's not going to explain all that to you using all the anatomical terms that she's aware of, uh, nor, telling you, des nor describing to you all the chemical processes that she has studied in med school. She's going to tell you something like, you're sick, you got to go home, you got to rest, you got to take this medicine. She's going to break it down for us. Well, that's the way God talks to us. He talks to us oftentimes in simple language. But it is nonetheless clear from Scripture that God has complete, comprehensive understanding of all things. And that's our next point as we think about the nature of God. He's infinite in knowledge. God knows man, for example. The Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Uh, 1 Samuel uh, 2, 3. He knows our actions. He knows our thoughts. The Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. Of 1 Chronicles 28, 9. I know that you can do everything and that no thought can be withheld from you. Job 42, 2. He knows our emotions. I know the things that come into your mind. Ezekiel eleven five. Lord, all my desire is before you and my groaning is not hid from you. Psalm 38, verse 9. He knows our secrets. Shall not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Psalm 44, 21. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 24. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? <laughs> he that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that teaches man knowledge, shall he not know? Psalm 94, verses 9 and 10. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us, and who knows us? Isaiah 29, 25. Shall the thing form say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Isaiah 29, 16. He knows all angels, good and evil, and all other created beings, with that very same deep knowledge with which he knows us. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 Hell is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. Job 26.6 And just as he knows all his creatures, so he knows all possible knowledge. All possible knowledge in science, in mathematics, in astronomy, and every other subject. He tells the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Do you know how the clouds are balanced? Those wondrous works of him who's perfect in knowledge. Job 37. He knows not only all creatures and all facts about all things. He knows all that will be in the future. Isaiah 46, 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Acts 15, 18. The late pastor James Montgomery Boyce wrote, He knows all the past, the present, and future of all things, knowing the future with the very same certainty and accuracy with which he knows the present and the past, for the future is already as present to him as though actually existing with the creatures and time belonging to it. And as it is distinctly perceived, and it is as distinctly perceived as it shall be then. God is all-seeing. God is omniscient. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. His eyes behold the nations. Now, as you know, our technology has advanced at this point in history so that we have what they call night vision goggles. 
if you're uh, in the military, uh, I don't know if you got, do you use any of those things uh, over there, uh, Charles, when you were in the night vision goggles? Uh, uh, of course, uh, law enforcement uses them as well. Well, of course, God was uh, way ahead of us. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Psalm 139, verse 12. Just as the scriptures declare God to be infinite in, in knowledge, the scriptures declare God to be infinite in power. O oh Lord God of hosts, who is, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 89. He has power over all nature. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Psalm 135, verse 6. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3. He has power over all nature. He has power over all animals, all beasts of the earth. He told Noah of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Genesis 6, 20. He commanded the ravens of the air to feed Elijah. He sealed the mouths of Babylon's lions. He sent a fish with a coin in its mouth to Peter so he could pay the tribute money for the Lord Jesus, the temple tribute. He has power over the angels. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them who do iniquity. Matthew 13, 41. He has power over the demons. The demons in the, in the man of Gadara cried out, We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Are you come to torment us before the time? They had to go when Christ sent them. They could not enter that herd of swine until Jesus gave them permission. Allow us to go into that herd of swine. He gave them permission. He has power over the demon. He has power over men. How terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. Psalm 66, 3. In thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? 2 Chronicles 26. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand, God says. Deuteronomy 32, 39. His power is absolute. Presbyterian theologian R. L. Dabney said, since all the forces that exist except his own depend on him, they cannot limit his force. Hence his force is absolutely unlimited save by his own nature. His power is not limited by time. Whatever he once did, he can do again. He's able to go on making universes such as this one indefinitely as he was able, to, he is as able to do it as he was able to make this one. Our wills operate on the external. If you will to create a work of art, you have to, you choose the medium, and you, so you, you, you get a canvas, or, or you get a piece of wood, and then you have to have uh, instruments to carve the wood, or, or uh, uh, paintbrushes and paint to paint upon the canvas, and then you have to, 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 to plan it, and then you have to do the actual creative process. Uh, I will to do certain things with my hands. I can reach down and pick up this children's catechism. I can put it down again. I tell my hands what to do, and my hands respond. God's power is immediate. His simple volition, his simple will brings it to pass. No means are necessary to interpose between the will and the effect. So his will produces its effects on the objects thereof as immediately as our wills do on, for example, our hands. I can make my hand go up or down, this way, that way. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Although, of course, God may choose to act through second, secondary causes or second causes, just as we choose to act through secondary causes. Uh, for example, husband, you may decide to paint the interior of your home. Uh, it's your decision. And you, or to be more precise, your wife, is the principal cause <laughs> of the painting of the interior of the home. But if she wants it done well, you may choose to act through a secondary cause and hire a Chuck Mitchell. <laughs> or Chris Reiblick, or Tommy Crone, or someone else here to do it. And by the way, Tommy reminded me this week of the cry of the Christian painter. Repaint! Repaint! Thin no more! Yeah. Never gets old, does it? 
God's power is absolute, although he may choose to work through secondary causes. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth, as A.W. Pink put it. His government is exercised over inanimate matter, over the brute beasts, over the children of men, over angels, good and evil, over Satan himself. No revolving of a world, no shining of a star, no storm, no movement of the creature, no actions of men, no errands of angels, no deeds of the devil, nothing in all the vast universe can come to pass otherwise than as God has eternally purposed. Here is the foundation of faith. Here is a resting place for the intellect. Here is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's not blind faith, unbridled evil, man or devil, but the Lord Almighty who is ruling the world ruling it according to his own good pleasure and for his own eternal glory. Isaac Watts wrote, 10,000 ages ere the skies were into motion brought, all the long years and worlds to come stood present in his thought. There's not a sparrow or a worm but's found in his decrees. He raises monarchs to their throne and sinks them as he please. Well, We'll talk more about the nature of God next week, Lord willing. But as I draw this message to a close, you may be thinking, if in fact God is a great God, a self-existent creator, not bound by time, not bound by a physical body, if he's all-powerful, all-knowing, etc., if he created the billions of stars in our galaxy and there are billions of other galaxies, then why should he care about me? Well, as a shepherd, David had time and opportunity to meditate upon the heavens, and he asked a very similar question. Uh, uh, Pastor Barry read it earlier. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Psalm 8. And the biblical answer, of course, is that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Our character and nature was patterned after God himself. Our exceptional capacity to reason and to create and to communicate, to love and to nourish, to protect and defend the measure of authority that God has given us over the creatures. Surely these are just some of the ways that we were created in his image. We have a special place in God's creation. He made us a little lower than the angels. He's crowned us with glory and honor. He's given us dominion over the works of his hands. He's put all things under our feet. And notably, one aspect of that image is holiness. He created us holy, set apart, without sin. But tragically, as you know, we rebelled against God. We violated his law. And into this world came sin with all of its consequences. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, Romans 5, 19. And the fall of man has defiled this image of God. But it has not completely eradicated it. Man is still viewed as unique. And human life is still of great value. Even after the fall, we read, whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Genesis 9, 6. One would have thought that our act of rebellion would have caused God to forever withdraw his love and compassion from us, but it did not. He had mercy upon his fallen creatures. He provided a way whereby we could be forgiven and restored. It was a costly way. It was the way of suffering. It was the via dolorosa. God covenanted with the second person of the Trinity, his own dear son, to come to earth and to live the righteous life that you and I have failed to live and then to go to the cross and to pay the debt that you and I deserve to pay. And God laid his wrath upon his own dear son and then God raised him from the dead and, and, and Jesus sent his apostles forth to proclaim this good news. We're going to be remembering that suffering of Christ in a moment through the Lord's Supper. Well, let me just say this. God has granted to you the precious gift of life. And now he offers you something else, something more. Forgiveness, reconciliation to him. The opportunity to do what you were created to do, to glorify him, the eternal, immortal, invisible, all-seeing, all-powerful, ever-present creator and sustainer of all life. Let's pray. Father, we'll never be able to wrap our minds around you. Your thoughts are not as our thoughts, your ways not as our ways. But we want to understand as much as we can. So we pray that you'll reveal yourself to us as we study your scriptures. 
And as we look at your own dear son, no man has seen God at any time but the only begotten son. He hath declared him. Thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, speak to us now as we meditate upon his suffering. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.